Okay. Okay, dokie. So now let's head over to modules. And dig a little deeper under uh, cellular today. And uh, oh, there it is. Kind of look a little bit, you know, I did the view from 30,000 feet the other day. So we're going to look a little deeper into how some of that works, partially because it applies to this chapter, partially because those concepts. Uh, cellular is a way of building a network, it's not a particular network. So when we get into 802.11, we'll be using cellular concepts to, to build that network. So it's worth going ahead and spending the time to do it. Right now, slideshow from the beginning. Ta-da. Okay, so as I said, cellular, net, cellular is a way of building a network. And basically what, what you do with cellular, instead of considering coverage of a single transmitter, you use controlled coverage of several, ra I say transmitter, radio site, transmit and receive. You use controlled coverage from several sites to provide your coverage area, and you use some techniques behind it so that your users can have mobility between those. And I sort of glossed, I went over that at a, I won't say glossed over, I went over it at a high level uh, last time. And we're going to take a look at it again today. So back to our basic radio system. You know, we've got our way we've been looking at things all semester. We have a transmitter on the left end, receiver on the right end, some distance between them. Of course, we're talking duplex systems. I'm just using transmitter and receiver because it's easier. This actually works, of course, in both directions. Some distance D. And we know from stuff we looked at earlier in the semester that noise can be a problem with these. And once we get sufficiently far from the transmitter, local noise sources, sources close to the receiver, can actually generate about as much signal as what we're receiving from our desired signal from the transmitter. Um, we're going to kind of play with that idea a little bit today in, in looking at cellular. We also know that other perfectly legitimate signals can show up. We call it interference, but from our, from our point of view, it is noise. I mean, if we define noise as a signal reducing our ability to receive our desired signal, then interference is a noise signal. Now, we, kind, we use noise typically to talk about naturally occurring noise or man-made noise that is not coherent. In other words, you know, static from our generators, things like that, instead of other communication systems. And we talk about interference as legitimate systems doing what they should be doing, but causing an effect of noise on our system. We also took a look at how distance affects all this. So if we have a desired signal, and we have an interfering signal, and our receiver is about equal distance between those two, and they're about equally powerful. Look at what the receiver is having to deal with. They have two signals. They're about the same strength. How does the receiver decide which one to use? Uh, pardon? Well, you can say which one's higher, but if, if they're about the same level, it can't decide. That that that's the problem. You're right. You're right, and we deal with that in certain. We deal with that in certain circumstances, or in different circumstances, different ways. For example, FM modulation has something called a capture effect, and it will tend to capture the stronger signal and then stay with that signal until the other one actually gets stronger. Still, what happens in this intermediate area, of course, the signals vary, and it'll ping pong back and forth. And you've heard that if you've driven down the road listening to FM, trying to hear a station far away, and there's another station on that same channel, 
you hear them both intermittently. That's just the way FM does it. AM tends to mix the signals. You hear both of them simultaneously. Uh, so it depends on the modulation scheme. In this situation, what we're looking at, though, is that our desired signal and our interfering signal are both being picked up by the receiver at about equal levels, and we need to somehow separate those. Um, this is a tough nut to crack electronically at the receiver. It's not impossible, but it's very hard. Um, so we've tended, we've tended to look at a systems approach to doing it, particularly when we look for high capacity systems like we're talking about in this module, which are uh, cellular systems. Now remember when we looked early on in the semester, we talked about how signal strength varies with distance. It's, you know, that's that inverse square law of decay. So as we increase the distance, signal level drops. And in particular, if we look at increasing the distance by multiples, we can look at what happens to that signal that way. So for example, if I look at a change uh, from 100 meters to 200 meters, that's a factor of change, a delta in distance of two. All right, 100 meters to 200 meters, I've doubled my distance. And our signal strength drops by one over that change squared. So if I double the distance, I drop the received signal strength by a factor of four. That's that inverse square law that we talked about earlier. If I triple the distance, now we're talking about one over three squared or one ninth the signal. So distance is our friend if we're trying to separate signals on the same channel. As I move an interfering signal further away, its signal is going to drop very rapidly. Okay? I'm seeing some quizzical looks. Is this? Is it supposed to be 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters, 200 meters? Yeah. So, and the thing, the thing that confuses people when you first run into this, delta D is not the mileage, the change in meters, it's the factor of change. So if I go from 100 meters to 200 meters, yeah, if I go from 100 meters to 200 meters, it's not, delta D is not 100 meters, it's a factor of two. New distance divided by old distance, if you want to do it that way. So the amount of change squared. So if I go from 100 meters to 400 meters, what fraction of my, sig my received signal strength would I have? 100, I'm going from 100 meters to 400 meters, what fraction of the signal strength would, would I get at the new distance? 1 16th, because 100 to 400, I take 400 divided by 100, what's the result? 4, that's delta D. 4 squared is 16, so 1 over 16. Yeah, it's, con it's confusing. This is not a distance measure, it's a factor of distance. But notice what's going on there. My interfering signal strength falls off pretty fast. I mean, this isn't a linear thing. This is logarithmic, or geometric, I'm sorry. OK. We talk about the relationship of carrier strength, our desired signal strength we'll call carrier, and interfering signals, which we'll call noise, we talk about that signal strength relationship as carrier to noise ratio, and it's typically expressed in dB. Now, when you go in, if you take uh, TSM-321, we actually dig into how you calculate this and what it should be and stuff like that. For this class, we're just going to say we want a larger carrier to noise ratio is better than a smaller carrier to noise ratio. You know, 20 dB is better than 10 dB. Okay. So how do we make use of this in our cellular systems? Well, cellular systems have multiple transmitters. And because we have a limited number of channels, we're going to operate some of those transmitters, some of those radio sites, I should say, on the same frequencies. Now, the problem is, if we do those adjacent to each other, we've set up exactly the problem we've been talking about. 
How do, I, how do you solve the problem? Well, it's exactly what we've been talking about. We're going to move the interfering signal further away. What happens to carrier? Uh, carrier, I actually did C to I carrier interference. That should be C to N. I'll change it. Carrier to noise. As I move the interfering signal further away, carrier to noise ratio goes up, right? I've got more desired signal than I do interfering signal. Okay? Does that make sense to you? Okay? What we do in cellular is we take that idea and we actually put some numbers on it. And like I said, we're in here, we're just going to look at the concept. I'm going to design my network so I reuse frequencies. I can actually use the same frequencies here as I can here, but I'm going to ensure that I separate them by a distance that is sufficient for the receiver to be able to, to get the desired signal rather than the interfering signal. Now, when we set up this kind of system, the, a particular type of interference that we're talking about is called co-channel interference. Co-channel meaning two transmitters using the same frequency. So for co-channel interference, and to control it in a cellular system, what we're going to do is control the distance that stations on the same frequency are separated with. What happens as I increase, what happens to carrier to noise ratio as I increase that distance for the for a receiver? Yeah, it goes up because I've moved from our noise situation, if this is our desired transmitter, I have a phone right here, for example, this is the interfering signal. This is the co-channel interference source. Actually, this is too, and if you'll notice, what we've done is set up a distance, and we're going to keep that as a minimum. Okay? So I'm using distance to control signal strength of an interfering station, and I'm designing that into my network. Why? Because the more times I can use the same frequency, the more service I can provide to individuals. Each device has to have its own bandwidth to access this. Even in a packet network, this works. You know, if, you were if packet networks solved everything just by being packet, we could run one Ethernet cable and connect every device on Earth. We know it doesn't work. What happens as you add more and more and more devices to Ethernet? what happens to your chance of being able to transmit when you want to transmit. It goes down. Yeah, because I'm getting more and more and more collisions. Okay, you have the same thing going on here. What I'm doing by using, reusing frequencies and using that to control coverage is I'm controlling the number of users in a given area and therefore I'm controlling the probability that they'll be able to use the network. The, problem, the, the great idea and the problem with packet networks is that they are statistically oriented in terms of access. You cannot guarantee access at a particular instant on a packet network. You can come pretty close with scheduling and some of the techniques we've looked at, but you can't guarantee it. So, so we have to control that within the bounds of what we're trying to do in there. This whole scheme of being able to use frequencies on multiple co-channel sites is called frequency reuse, and it's actually the, the, one of the founding uh, core bedrock principles of how cellular works. What you're actually controlling is the density of user access as a function of the area of cell coverage. Now, that's a mouthful and it's all scientific sounding and everything. Basically, I'm saying I'm going to see how many users I have on average, you know, statistically in an area, and I'm going to set cell size larger or smaller so that I keep about the same number of users in each cell. If my users are further apart, I'm out, you know, in a, in a farm area or something like that, I'm going to set those cell areas pretty big. If I'm standing in the middle of downtown Manhattan, I'm going to make them pretty small because I've got a lot more users in the same area, but I want roughly the same amount of usage in each cell. Now, 
I'm obviously talking at a very high level. Different systems do this differently. Different math applies to different morphologies. The overall principle is I'm controlling the, the, amount, the user density by cell size. Okay? And that's what we really get into when we talk about uh, cellular systems. Okay? Once we have, come on fingers, <laughs> once we have that situation going, we start building a structure to cover our area. I want to cover the area of Callaway County. I'm going to pick an easy one. So what I'm going to do is establish where my users are, and I'm then I'm going to establish transmitter locations that let me provide coverage to pretty much that whole area with overlapping patterns. Now remember we talked last time that the actual physical pattern is round. Where we overlap, we, we, we see a line, so we actually depict these for thinking about purposes, thinking about purposes, as, as hexagonal cells. The coverage areas are pretty much circular. We're talking about this as a logical view, okay? And the reason is this controlled coverage area is only part of the cellular network. It's a necessary part, but it's only part. Each one of these by itself can't do anything except provide coverage in that one cell. So what we do is connect them all through an intelligent network. In the cellular service, this is typically called a mobile switching center. Uh, in an 802.11 system, which we'll look at, this is actually a protocol that's distributed on each AP that works across the, back plane, the backbone network. What that function does is let the multiple sites coordinate keeping track of where a user is. Because the situation we're getting into is that, whoops, I'm sorry. That wasn't supposed to be the end of that. The situation we're getting into There we go. Nope. Situation we're getting into is that if I have a user in one of these cells and that user is moving, I'm going to have to somehow take that user from whatever frequency this cell is using and change him to whatever frequency this cell is using. Okay? This intelligent network control does that by looking at received signal strength in one way or another, and I'm saying it that way because different systems do this, accomplish this differently. They're actually doing the same thing. They're just getting at it differently. What they're going to do is keep track of an identifiable individual mobile user, and they're going to compare signal strength. So, for example, if I start inside this cell, and I'm right next to it, this cell is going to have the best coverage of me, and these other cells are going to have, if any coverage, something relatively small. If I start walking this way, my signal strength as received at this cell site is going to be dropping if I'm moving away from it. That's that distance coming into play. You know, as I double my distance, my signal strength drops by a factor of four. As I triple it, it drops by a factor of nine, and then a factor of 16, and so on and so forth. At the same time, since I'm moving towards this cell, my signal strength is increasing. So the converse of that is how I'm going to start at 1 16th of the signal relative to what this one has. And as I move closer to this one, the distance is going to drop, so that fraction of the signal strength is going to come up. I'm going to get a ninth, then a fourth, and I'm going to get into good signal area. When I'm in this area of overlap, the network, this intelligent network function knows enough to detect that pattern that I move, that this signal is dropping, this one is rising, and it's going to say I need to change frequencies that this mobile is using before it gets out of range of this one. So we're going to coordinate moving channels for the mobile. Now the user doesn't have to do anything with this. You know, you don't do this actively. 
on the cell network, you drive down the road and have your phone call. The cell network instructs your mobile device to change its frequencies. And there are a couple of ways you can, you can accomplish it. The process is called handoff, handover is a term you'll hear. There is a variation on the term called soft handover and hard handover. Hard handover is kind of like one, two, three, jump. <laughs> you know, okay, he's coming up. He's coming up to the line. When he gets to the line, you're going to turn off these channels. I'm going to turn on these channels. And mobile, you're going to do, you're going to change from this channel to this channel. Ready? Do it. That's hard handover. Now, the problem is what happens if, <laughs> if right at that instant something goes wrong? You know, I've put all, everything together. Soft handover means I'm going to send as I see this pattern occurring, I'm going to start sending traffic destined for that mobile to both of these towers. And I'm going to let the mobile get it, get traffic from either one of them for a while. As I statistically start getting more and more traffic from this one, I'm going to stop sending it to this tower at some point. Soft handover. Um, the reason you choose those is out of the scope of this class. It depends on the application you're using, depends on the underlying protocols, depends on how critical timing is and how critical sequencing is, way past what we're doing in here. But the end result is the same thing. My mobile changes frequency as I move across the boundaries between cells. Okay? We've just described moving from a layer two boundary to a layer two boundary without going through layer three. So this is not a routed function. Okay. If it were routed, I would have to break a lot of my I'd have to break my IP connections and reestablish them. So this is based on layer two functioning. Okay. As I change from tower to tower, this intelligent network control associates my IP traffic, because that's really what we're talking about in most situations now, associates my IP traffic with whatever layer two path needs to get it to my mobile. Pretty neat trick when you think about it. There's an awful lot going on under the hood. You okay with this? It's one of those things that you, you can outline in about two sentences. And when you start thinking through it, it gets pretty deep pretty fast. Key principles. We are controlling coverage area of individual cells so we can target the amount of users in a given area. As we have higher user density, we need smaller cells. As we have lower user density, we increase cell size. In other words, we're trying to keep loading, if you want to use that term, traffic, amount of traffic within bounds, within relatively strict bounds, and we do that by controlling coverage of the cell. We're going to coordinate that activity so that layer two communication is continuous and we associate that layer two stream with layer two, layer three addressing out to the rest of the world. So the rest of the world doesn't have to worry about this whole process. Remember, layered protocols, that's, that's part of the reason of them. You, know, you in Tokyo don't have to worry about how my Western Kentucky cellular network works. You just send something to the IP address that I'm associated with, and up we come. Yeah. When you start connecting these networks together, you are, in effect, creating an internet, and usually you're attaching to the internet. Okay, the internet's the one we all think of. An internet means an interconnection between multiple layer two networks. Depending on what you're trying to do, you might ex you can you will vary the size of this layer two division. I hesitate to even put geographic boundaries on it anymore because honestly, I have not kept up with what carriers are doing with it. I usually think of it just because it's convenient for me to do so. So understand, what I'm outlining here is an idea to get you thinking down a particular path. I'm not saying this is the way it's done now. I could, for example, make all the cell sites 
in each county one layer two network and make a layer three boundary as I crossed county lines. The advantage of that is anything that happens within a county, I would still be roaming, I wouldn't have to reestablish layer three connections. When I crossed the county line, I would have to reestablish layer three connections. Now, can you do that? Sure you can. You know, reestablishing is just that. I pick up and I go out and I re renegotiate what my layer three connection is. Um, it takes time, it takes processor cycles. Some applications may not like doing it. So I have to consider what I'm trying to accomplish with the whole network. As I get further away, let's say I put all of the West Kentucky sites in one layer two network. And then when I cross a state boundary, for example, I do that. That's actually, I think, still pretty common. And the reason I say that is you have cellular companies regulated by state PSC. So they roughly draw their boundaries equal to states. It's just easier since that's the way things are laid out. From a business point of view, I want to look at this as a way to get my information or my data or my access, whatever I'm trying to provide to my users for the benefit of the company. I want to get that to them wherever they are. So I'm going to look at, obviously, coverage, but I also want to look at what applications I'm doing. If you're doing you know, web stuff and accessing a database, and this is simple. You know, if I'm doing sensor type things that might be more latency dependent or might have more stringent criteria, then I may have to make a deal with a carrier so that I actually have a layer two connection outside their layer two boundaries. In other words, I'm going to create a bridge between parts of the network. The details of this are where it gets really complex. The, simp the concept of what's going on is pretty easy. Okay. LTE is designed to accomplish this and is heavily biased towards layer two as the way of moving my wide area net around. I don't make LTE as I understand it. And again, what I know about LTE is textbook. I have not worked on it or anything like that. As I understand it, LTE is a layer two system completely on the internal side of things, and then we VLAN or and the, the equivalent to VLANs to set up customer boundaries. Let me read some more and I'll fill in the gaps on that. Are you okay with this as a concept? Like I said, this is the first time we've really hit a technology that you're not, unless you work for a carrier or a really big government entity, you're not going to directly implement this. What you're going to do is treat this as a cloud for your users out here on the end, but you have to know enough about the cloud to know how your particular combination of traffic is going to work. Also have to remember, <laughs> there are other people out here, possibly my competitors. So I want to pay attention to what security environments are available in that. I will leave that for Wesley and the security classes to deal with specifically. But basically, you're talking about, from our point of view, you're talking about end-to-end -end encryption. You're talking about the same techniques you would use for tunnels across the public internet, for example. OK? Well, if that's it, then we're going to have a short class today, which I don't think anybody will complain about. <laughs> So, um, what I am going to do, um, I'm behind on getting exercise stuff up for you. So rather than meet again on Friday, I'm going to let I'm going to give you at least an hour <laughs> to work on exercise stuff. I'm going to get exercise stuff up. We'll meet again on Monday. So uh, just 
watch uh, watch for the exercises, do them. We will have another project coming up here pretty soon. Uh, this one should be fairly quick and dirty, really. <laughs> so you've got a couple of big ones coming up in the end, so I'll make a small one for you. But we won't meet Friday. We will. I will set the deadlines on the exercises for the material out of this section to be due Monday. Uh, I'm available for questions Friday if you need me. But it's just that I don't want to get further than that ahead of the exercise material. Okay? See you guys.